Okay, I guess we're going there. So, Dr. Beachy, uh, the floor is all yours. Okay. Let's see, am I sharing my screen now? Can you see it? Or do I need to click? Can you hear me okay? You can, you should be able to just use your standard um, PowerPoint right arrow to move through your program. Okay. All right. But you can see my screen now? I, I can. I see the, um, okay. the stream with a couple of white uh, big yep. salmon going up there. Okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. So today, um, let's see. If I, it's not advancing. There we go. Okay, so today I'm going to go over um, a few things about natural wood stability and function first, um, just to give you a context for wood restoration. And then I'm going to talk about um, using wood in restoration. Uh, and for both of those first two topics, I'm going to separate small from large channels because there are some significant differences in the wood sizes and wood functions in those two channel types. And then after that, I'm going to talk about climate change and restoration design. I should have slides for about 30 to 40 minutes uh, and should leave plenty of time for questions, I hope. Um, and I don't know if people can ask questions at any time, but if you can, just go ahead and interrupt at any point. Uh, there's, it's, I don't have to have continuity all the way through this. Yeah, so those of you that want to ask questions, you can raise your hand and I will activate your microphone. You can ask uh, your question that way or you can post it in the question pod. Uh, and then I can keep track of those and relay them on to Dr. Beachy. All right, thanks. <clears throat> so first, uh, wood size and function, I'll talk about small streams first. Um, this graph just shows uh, from three different studies, uh, the blue line on the bottom is the smallest pool forming size. So this is at the low end of the size distribution, what's the smallest piece in any particular channel width that can form a pool? And you see that it's a pretty linear increasing trend there from uh, about a 5-inch diameter piece down around a 10-foot channel width up to probably 20 inches around 65 feet in channel width. Um, and that's from a study that we did uh, back in the 80s in uh, the still Guamish and Snohomish River basins. The middle line is from Bilby and Ward, the yellow one, and that one is just the median size of pieces in unlogged basins. So that's kind of a reference point. It's not necessarily functional wood. It's just the median size of everything that's in the channel. And it has a very similar increasing trend, but larger size. And then finally, the green line is key pieces. And those are pieces that are large enough to be independently stable in a channel and trap other pieces of wood. So they're essentially anchor pieces that can initiate the formation of wood jams, uh, and they're the largest piece. But the one thing you notice is that all the trends are very similar. They're just um, at different levels. So we've got the smallest piece, again, on the bottom in the blue, and the largest functioning piece on the top in the green. So what those pieces can do in a channel, in headwater channels, one of the main functions uh, of these pieces of wood is to trap sediment. Um, and it can convert uh, bedrock channels to alluvial channels. So on that lower photo, um, you see a recently debris flowed channel, it's scoured to bedrock, there's no sediment and there's really not much habitat structure, um, even though this isn't a habitat for salmon, it's habitat for lots of other critters um, when it's in its undebris flowed state. Um, and once it traps gravel, the at upper picture shows a big jam of wood, there's a big wedge of sediment behind it and you can see gravel just below it, um, so there's sequential wedges in these channels when there's wood in them. And that does a number of things for the ecosystem function. Mainly, it stores sediment and retains nutrients so that the system is more productive. You get more invertebrate production, and it's good for amphibians, and it also provides nutrients to the downstream ecosystem. Uh, that trapping of water also keeps a fair amount of the water in the gravel instead of rolling across bedrock, and that keeps it cooler. So temperatures coming out of the non-debris float streams tend to be quite a bit cooler than the ones uh, that have been debris float. And the graph on the lower left just shows um, the relationship between wood volume in cubic meters per meter of channel length um, against, uh, or sediment volume in cubic meters per meter of channel length against the wood volume. So 
you can see that they're closely related. The more wood you have, the more sediment is stored. And that work is from Michael Pollack. It was unpublished, but we still use this graph. So habitat formation by wood down in the lower gradient streams, uh, the less than 4% slope, which is pretty much where salmon would be hanging out. Uh, we have uh, an increasing trend of percent pool area. So the proportion of the habitat that's pool area as opposed to riffle increases as wood volume increases. And you notice in this graph that the slope of the channel plays a role in, in the response of pools to wood. So in the lower, uh, the lower line with the black points, the filled circles, that is um, channels from 2 to 4% slope. And you can see that in general they have lower pool area than high gradient channels or than lower gradient channels for the same wood volume. Uh, and they have a slightly steeper increasing trend, uh, meaning they're a little bit more sensitive uh, to wood volume, but the um, pool percentages won't get as high as they will in the low gradient channels. And then the open circles, obviously, are the low gradient channels. and Still an increasing trend, but it looks like it's going to top out at about 80% there on average. So you can get up to 90% pool, um, but uh, in general, it's going to max out before that. Another thing that wood does is break the, pool, the channel up into smaller units. So in addition to creating um, more pool area, it creates more pools, a greater number of pools. And that um, has an effect on the ability of the stream to process nutrients and it provides more feeding stations for juvenile rearing salmon. So in a, a channel with more pools, uh, you essentially have a higher capacity even if the pool area is the same. And you see a similar relationship here again with the channel gradient. The um, lower number of pools uh, in the low gradient channels and higher number of pools in the steeper channels. So the result of that is a difference in uh, pool area. And this table shows the reference condition, which is in the green. So this is a number of channels that we surveyed in unlogged areas in the different slope classes. So the less than 2%, the 2 to 4%, and the greater than 4%. And you see a decreasing trend in the percent pool area um, as you go from lower slope to higher slope. So 64% pool in the reference condition in the less than 2% channels, and then not too much decrease to the moderate slope, and then a significant decrease to the steeper channels, down to 35% on average. And what happens when uh, various land uses occur around those is a change in the pool percentage. And you see a couple of things in this graph, one or, or in this highlighted section. One is that uh, in the mid-gradient channels, the 2 to 4%, there's a significant drop in pool area in forestry and rural areas. So this is either commercial forest or streams that are running through urban or semi-urban areas. And in both cases, when you pull the wood out, you get a significant drop uh, in pool area. And these two pictures on the right kind of illustrate what's going on. So this moderate gradient channel here in the bottom with no wood, you can see it just turns into one long ripple. And that's just because it's a little bit too steep to form pools on its own. It doesn't really um, have bar formation and meander bend pools because it's too steep. And then here's a similar channel, similar gradient channel up above with lots of wood in it. And you get, again, the gravel steps that we talked about earlier. And then there are pools in each of these steps and then pools down here below as well. So those channels tend to be more sensitive. In the low gradient channels, you see that from unlogged to forestry or rural, there's not a really big difference in pool area. And that's because these channels uh, at this low gradient have self-formed pools. So at meander bends, they will create pools. And they can be fairly large. So even though there may be fewer of them because there's no wood, the pool area doesn't change that much. The difference with the agriculture, we think, is due to the fact that most of those are highly manipulated. They're dredged and channelized, and they have levees along the sides of them. So they've been artificially simplified. And so they have, the, they have a lower pool area. Um, but we think that's mainly because of the manipulation of the channel in addition to the wood removal. So that's wood size and function for the small channels. Now if we move to large rivers, um, there's a significant difference, as I said earlier, in how wood can function in a large river. And you can see from this picture that this is a very big channel. And there really aren't any trees on our landscape that are going to span that whole channel. So um, most of the wood is mobile. And you can see in this one, this is what we call a meander jam, defined by Tim Abbey. And um, it's just wood racked up all along the outside of this bend. Uh, and I'll show you an aerial shot of it so you can see what it looks like here. So this is the same spot with George was standing about here on the wood and the picture was taken from here looking this direction back for a second so you can just get a look at that again. So we're looking out this way 
and this is the racked wood and you can see that it pretty much armors this entire bank um, and one of the key things it does is create this long pool uh, and then it also has this really high cover value so there's a lot of little nooks and crannies here for fish to hide in and so it has um, very high densities of fish because uh, there's a lot of places for them to um, avoid predators uh, and also there's a fair amount of food production on the wood itself so it's a very productive habitat for fish to rear in these form uh, initially from just a few pieces of wood. So here's an early stage meander jam. And so this is the meander bend. And you can see these these are very large logs. They're actually probably over two foot diameter at the at breast height with the root wads attached. And you can see that they kind of land like anchors as they're floating down the channel and run into the bar. The first thing that catches is the root wad because it's sitting the deepest and then all of the stems orient downstream. So you have a bunch of pieces of wood with these root wads lining up against the flow and then it starts to rack up this wood here. So over time, you'll get this wood building up and it eventually protects that channel bank so that you can start to develop a floodplain behind the meander jam. So going back to this one, this is the old one. Um, where we've got wood racked up all the way over to here and a fairly mature forest behind it because it's been protected for such a long time. Another type of jam that you get, uh, there's really two major types in the large rivers. There's that meander jam and then this one's called the bar apex jam. Uh, and this one, um, obviously it's named because the wood racks up at the apex of this bar and creates an island. So there's some key pieces underneath here that I'll show you in a second on another picture. but the Protection here does a number of things. The first thing it does is allow finer sediment to get trapped on this bar um, behind uh, behind the wood jam. And then it also traps seeds, and then uh, that allows the forest to grow. And then with some protection from the high velocity flow, that allows the seedlings to survive a little bit easier. So here's what one of these looks like in, in formation. This is the flow direction this time going down here. And again, you see this one key piece oriented downstream. So again, the, the root wad lands first, and then the stem swing, swings to a downstream orientation. And then it begins to rack up wood. And so this one has really just started to um, create the fine sediment zone behind it. Um, but there's uh, very little vegetation. This is probably a tiny bit of vegetation starting here, but pretty soon and this will start to fill in. Um, with seedlings and then it will grow into a forest. So again, this is the early stage and then this is the late stage. And so this um, not only creates some terrestrial habitat here, but it separates the flow and usually one of the channels is much smaller so that you have a diversity of habitat types for multiple species. So out here, you've got a large river channel which is really good for um, Chinook spawning or maybe steelhead spawning. Whereas these smaller channels are where you'll probably find the coho spawning. You might find steelhead there as well. Um, but fish that, are, uh, that normally you would find in a small tributary, you can also find in a main stem river as long as they have these multiple side channel habitats. So that complexity is important uh, for the ecosystem. So this is uh, a modified graph, or, or simplified I should say, from Abbey and Montgomery in 2003. And so Tim Abbey worked out in the Queets River Basin and he surveyed uh, hundreds of pieces of wood and, and hundreds of jams out there and came up with a system of typing these jams um, and then was able to plot them against stream size. So that's the drainage area on the lower axis here and number of jams per kilometer. And one of the things you notice is that there's a line here. It's probably around 20 to 30 square kilometers in area, which is probably about a 15 meter bankful channel width or um, width between the ordinary high water marks. And channels that are smaller than that, most of the wood is stable. So these, where you have log steps or bankful bench jams or channel spanning jams, a lot of this wood is not mobile and that's because the channels are small enough that when, when the larger trees fall in, they can span the whole channel and that becomes a key piece. Uh, and then smaller pieces obviously move through the channel but they tend to rack up on the larger pieces and we get these fairly stable um, features Log steps tend to be individual logs. They're not usually um, jams. Um, and then the bankful jams and the channel spanning jams are, are larger accumulations of wood. When you get to mostly mobile wood, these are the two that I just showed you pictures of. So you have the meander jams and the bar apex jams. And that's because most of that wood, as we saw in the pictures, is floating down the river. And then when it finds a shallow enough bar to get hung up on, yeah, it can begin to, to create a jam of one type or the other. <clears throat> 
the habitat formation piece. So in large rivers, in the picture I showed you that there is a little bit of pool formation along the margin, but there's also um, the issue of just velocity of habitats. So when you look at juvenile salmon in, in general, in this graph we have Chinook, Coho, Rainbow, and Chum um, at two different seasons. Um, most of their habitat preferences are for low velocity, relatively shallow areas. So you find them in areas that tend to be less than about a half a meter per second or what's that, about a foot and a half per second velocity. And when you're in a large river, almost everything out in the mid-channel is much faster than that. Even if you're in a pool, the velocity out there is probably three feet per second or something like that. So uh, it's much harder for them to rear out there. So you tend to find them all along the edge. And these um, wood uh, or these uh, cover types that we have in this plot here are complex wood, aquatic plants, cobble and boulder, and then no cover. Uh, and these are all along channel margins. So we're not talking about the um, the main channel, we're talking about the edge of the channel as we saw with that wood jam or on other banks where there's no cover or areas where there's cobbling boulder or aquatic plants. And what you see with the summer, this is uh, summer on the top here, or winter, sorry, on the top here, we have um, Chinook, Coho, Rainbow, uh, Zero Plus, which are the young of the year, and then One Plus, which means they've been in fresh water for one year. Um, and you see in all of these graphs that the, the largest proportion of the fish uh, are in complex wood. It's not always statistically significant, so there's a couple where there's a fair amount in cobble boulder as well, but the highest median, which is these bars in the whiskers here, is always um, in the complex wood. Less of a clear trend in winter, although we see with coho, they tend to stay in the complex wood, uh, or in the summer, sorry. Uh, they tend to, tend to stay in the complex wood in the summer, but the other ones are a little bit more equal, um, less preference uh, for wood in the summertime. So again, that's the habitat formation piece, and uh, and it's mostly along the banks when we're talking about, about large rivers. So that's just a little bit of an overview of how wood um, functions in rivers, and then I'll move on now to process-based restoration. So the basis for this, um, we came up with this idea quite a while ago when we were thinking about how to manage for multiple species, and what we ended up coming with, up with is a couple of key statements that we thought sort of captured how our systems work both biologically and physically. And one statement was that um, species are adapted to local conditions. So that's sort of a long-standing ecological and biological concept that species are adapted to the place that they're living in. Uh, and then if we look at the physical side of our landscape here, especially in the Pacific Northwest, it's very dynamic. Those habitats are constantly moving in space and time, um, at least in the natural state. And so what we decided was that, um, you know, a simple sort of guiding statement was that in our case, especially managing for salmon, salmon are adapted to dynamic, uh, to a dynamic landscape. So uh, that sort of led us to stop thinking about engineering um, as an approach to restoration, uh, or at least come up with an alternative to engineering as, re as restoration and try and get back more to restoring those processes that um, cause the problem in the first place. So if we're talking about a channel um, that's over widened because it's had a big increase in sediment supply, the process-based solution is to deal with the sediment supply at the source and try and reduce that. Sometimes the engineering solution is to try and dredge that channel and see if, and then you know maybe do some restoration um, as well. Um, if we're talking about wood, uh, we're talking about usually the loss of the riparian forest and the loss of wood recruitment, um, which results in the loss of wood. And then the process-based approach would lead you to at least include as part of your restoration plan the restoration of the riparian zone and the wood recruitment process, even if you're going to put some wood in um, as part of the restoration action. So the four principles that we came up with are listed on this slide here. And the first one, the, really the main one, is to make sure that you target root causes of degradation. So that was our key principle. And then the other three are sort of corollaries to that. You don't really need them all, but we thought it helped clarify what we meant by targeting root causes of degradation. The second one is tailor restoration actions to local potential. And what we mean by this is make sure you understand what the capacity of the reach is that you're working in. So if you're in a steep channel that's fairly coarse and bouldery, there's only a certain number of things you can make out of that. You're not going to ever make a nice low grading pool ripple channel except for very short pieces that are behind log jams. Uh, in contrast to a low gradient channel where you can create a really complex habitat and maybe even multiple channels. 
that's a large enough river uh, and create some off-channel habitat. But those are somewhat mutually exclusive because of the environments that, they're, that, that you're in to start with. And so all we're saying is pay attention to the setting that you're in and make sure that what you're designing will actually function within that, um, you know, within that regime, both the flow regime and the sediment regime. The third one is match the scale of restoration to the scale of the problem, which is really just um, talking about uh, making sure that when a problem, well, the simple distinction is if we talk about point source issues versus non-point issues. So if you're talking about a sediment supply problem, for example, it's usually coming from a large number of places. And if you're going to address that problem, you have to make sure that you look at the watershed upstream of the areas that are affected and do restoration and probably a significant component of that watershed. You can contrast that with a reach scale problem like riparian functions, which are obviously addressed right there at the site. It doesn't really matter so much what's going on a mile or two upstream or elsewhere in the watershed. If you're going to fix that problem, you really need to be working at that site. So we're talking about the scale in a sort of general sense of is it a watershed scale problem or a reach scale problem. Um, and so that's the third principle. And then finally, be explicit about expected outcomes. And this, we just want people to make sure that they're making some reasonably quantitative predictions about what they expect uh, from a restoration action. And we, we wanted to add that in because we found that a lot of times um, people who are in the restoration business are a little bit optimistic about what they're actually getting. And if they're not monitoring, uh, they tend to believe they're doing more for the system than they're actually getting out of it. So what we want people to do is think through both physically what you expect. So if you're putting wood in a stream, how much change in pool area do you expect? Um, and I'll show you how we can use some of those graphs I showed earlier to help guide those those kinds of answers. Um, and then also biologically, what do you expect? You know, if you can only increase the pool area by 10% or 15%, that means you shouldn't expect a huge biological response either. So. Um, that's what we're talking about in that fourth one. So that's the four principles. Uh, for the rest of the talk today, I'm going to focus just on this second one, which is tailoring restoration actions to local potential, because a lot of the data that we have can be helpful in designing restoration actions um, for that, um, uh, designing restoration actions that are appropriate to different sites. So again, we go back to this kind of a, this kind of diagram from Tim Abbey, and there are other ones out there that we can use as well. But this one, I'll just stay stay with the same ones we used earlier for continuity. So again, mostly stable wood in the small channels. So if you're doing restoration, especially installing wood in small channels, uh, the kinds of things that you would be looking at are things like log steps or you know channel spanning jams, bankful jams, <clears throat> sometimes flow deflectors, you know, sort of jams along the edge. Those can all uh, function well in small streams, and if the stream is small enough, individual logs can function as well. Uh, you don't really need to have um, a jam in a small stream to function. If you're in large rivers, uh, this is where the, the sort of genesis of engineering log jams came about. People were starting to talk about how do we restore wood. This was back in the 90s in large rivers, and this is and Tim Abbey was one of the first to do it. And, this is from his thesis back when he was beginning that work, and he wanted to be able to use natural wood accumulations as analogs for the kinds of uh, engineered structures that he wanted to build. So he, the first thing he did was come up with this sort of reference picture. So you have this whole array of different types that you can build, and this gives you some guidance on what's appropriate in different parts of the drainage network. So just a few pictures. If we look at the small channels, here's some. This is a, a, an older picture, um, looking at the V V weirs. Um, so there's three of them here, and you can see them all lined up in sequence. Back in the 90s and pre-90s, this was kind of a common um, thing to do things that were very geometrical and looked a little bit engineered, but still functioned quite well. You can see that these are all creating plunge pools uh, and trapping gravel on the upstream side. So you get some spawning area and you get some rearing area in each of those. Over time, there's been a trend towards more natural uh, uh, restoration. So these are unanchored in this case, but also logs that have been put in the stream. Um, these are fairly old now because um, you can see the moss on them. But they're unanchored structures, and uh, they tend to function fairly similarly to um, ones that are uh, highly engineered like this, at least in terms of creating pools and creating habitat for fish. Uh, so that trend um, 
it's, I'm not sure if that's you know a, a universal trend. I think there's still a fair amount of fairly engineered looking structures out there, but there is more of this more natural looking structure out there now. Here's another one that's a little bit of a hybrid moving to a channel that's getting to be large, and so this is uh, a, a log deflector structure, but it has elements of an engineered log jam. You can see this anchored post or pile driven into the bed and then um, cabled wood uh, along next to it. So back to the data that we showed earlier, if we're working in these small channels, let's just look at these pictures again. If we're working in a channel of this size or this size, one of the first questions we would ask is how big a piece of wood do we need to be stable or to function or create a pool in the channel that we're working in? And then we go back to this data to help us answer that question. So we get a few things from this graph. One is if we want wood that's stable enough to trap other stable enough and large enough to trap other pieces of wood, then uh, we really want to be up here in this key piece range. So we can look at the size of the channel that we're in and take this information and say, okay, if we're looking at a 35-foot channel, we probably want to have wood that's a little over two feet in diameter uh, if we want it to be stable and function. This lower end here would just give you an idea, what's the smallest piece that might be useful? So if you're out in a 50-foot channel, you know anything less than about 15 inches isn't really going to help all that much and you should be up in this range. The median one, you could use that too if you just wanted to have some average um, sort of natural sized wood, but most people seem to tend to gravitate towards this upper line, at least for the key pieces that they're putting in, and then fill in with smaller pieces. Moving on to the large river, so this is one of the first engineered log jams built by Tim Abbey back in 95 or, or something like that. Um, so 20 years ago now, and you can see that this one is fairly natural looking. It's a, um, you know, not a very geometric accumulation of wood. It's about the same height as the floodplain, which is here behind it. Um, you know, and it doesn't have a bunch of gravel anchoring it on the top. So the, the trend for these has been, in some ways, the opposite of the trend for small streams, where the small streams went from kind of more engineered looking structures to more natural looking structures. These have gone from something like this, which is a little more natural looking, to things like this, which are more engineered looking. You can see this flow deflector one on the side that looks, you know, kind of a Lincoln log structure. It's very geometric and then it's filled with gravel. Here's another one uh, that's, you know, essentially a rectangle with the, you know, the flat front side and then the long uh, side going down the channel here. And you can see people up here for scale. This is a very high structure. So these structures are well above the floodplain in height, um, which is something that you wouldn't necessarily find naturally. Uh, so, there, and there's a good reason for um, them wanting to do this. One is they're expensive. Two good reasons, I'll say. One is they're expensive, and so they don't want them to wash away easily. Probably the more important reason is that they're afraid of legal liability. So consulting firms that are building these are, um, I guess, justifiably designing them so that there's very low risk of failure, uh, and that reduces their liability. Here's another picture of a couple. These are out in the Elwha, and you can see again that you know they have this sort of very geometric structure with the pilings, and then logs sort of laid symmetrically across, and then a lot of gravel fill to help stabilize and make sure uh, that it doesn't wash away. And these, you know, they're again they're not very natural looking structures, but they do perform the functions that natural um, structures would would, uh, would perform. So again, uh, if you're designing this, you want to be aware of what size wood pieces you could use. Um, and in this case, uh, we have from Tim Abbey again, he surveyed uh, just hundreds of pieces of wood, probably a couple thousand, um, in the Queets River and just recorded the length of the piece, the width of the channel at the piece's location, and then the diameter of the piece and the depth of the channel um, at that. Uh, location and what he found was essentially that you know if you had pieces that were more than half the bankful depth in diameter and more than half the bankful width in length, so if you were up in this zone, you would be pretty safe uh, in terms of stability. And these would be pieces that had root wads, root wads attached. So if the root wads not attached, this number would be slightly different. Um, and then this area over here is, is stable as well. But for simplicity, he defined this zone uh, as the stable zone. So the key pieces, again, are these large ones relative to the channel, and then this mid-zone is racked wood. So these are those pieces that tend to stack up 
um, perpendicular to the key pieces that we looked at in the photos, and then loose wood is just really small pieces that are just kind of floating around and um, can move in a flood. So the racked wood, once it gets uh, locked into the jam, tends not to move. The loose wood uh, can float away in the next flood. It's just kind of sitting on the top. Just a couple notes about restoration effectiveness. Uh, there's been quite a few studies looking at effectiveness of wood introductions to um, channels in small streams, very few in large rivers. And this is from a review that includes uh, probably a couple of large river studies, but the vast majority of these are, are uh, small streams. Uh, and this is from Phil Roney uh, and a few others of us at the Science Center who worked on this paper that came out in 2015 in Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences. Um, and you can see that for the Salmonids, which are uh, the two here in the middle, and the habitat, which is on the left, that by and large, you tend to get a positive response um, from wood introduction and a lot of, uh, also a lot of equivocal or, you know, sort of no change results from installation of wood. You don't get very many negative ones, but you do get a few of those. In the non-Salmonids, it's a little bit more um, sort of evenly spread. We have a, a bit more negative. Here it's not half, but it's a bit more, and you tend to only get about half of them actually creating an improvement for non-salmonid fishes or invertebrates. Um, and this is based on a fairly large number of studies. I forget the sample size, but uh, it's in the dozens at least. And then here's just a picture of, of what it looks like across species. So uh, the coho, the one that we think of here a lot um, as using wood uh, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, has a fairly large increase. This is right around 100%, which is a doubling of fish density. So this is a measure of uh, density in most cases. Some cases it's biomass. Um, but in this, uh, in this study, the average was right around, um, this is again from the review that Phil Roney did, um, looking across a large number of studies, the average was about a doubling per call uh, with some error around that or some uncertainty around that, some variation. For Atlantic salmon and rainbow trout, rainbow trout had the largest increase, uh, and some of these studies are from places like the Midwest, where they're a lot more focused on um, other species, um, and then also places where they're focused on resident trout as well as um, as well as uh, steelhead, which are way over here. So, the ones that we're looking at, uh, we're looking at maybe a 20% increase on average for steelhead, uh, in contrast to a much larger um, increase for uh, most likely resident rainbow. And then um, other species in between here, brook trout and brown trout, which we don't have, at least not native to our area, and then cutthroat um, kind of in between steelhead and cocoa in terms of response. That's um, what I was going to go through for the process basis for restoration. And, and mostly, again, that goes back to paying attention to where you are in the channel and what the potential is of that channel and then making sure that the structures you design are of the appropriate type for the place that you're working in and that the size of the wood you're using um, is designed to be stable uh, within that location. So the last thing I was going to talk about is do climate change uh, projections alter restoration designs? Um, and we're working on a different um, guidance paper for this right now. So this is a little bit of a hybrid between one that we published in 2013 which I'll show a couple of pieces from, uh, and a new one that we're working on. And so in the 2013 paper, we laid out a really simple sort of dichotomous key for deciding how to modify a design, a project design, given climate change expectations. Uh, but it was fairly crude. Um, and when we started to think it through a little bit later and try to make it more detailed, we realized it was a little more complicated than we had made it sound in the first paper. So these are the the questions we're moving towards now. The first one is make sure you know what the restoration project goal is because that's what you evaluate everything against in terms of climate change. Uh, so knowing what your goal is and having a rough idea of what your project is going to be, the question is, will climate change likely reduce action effectiveness? And that can be a biological failure or a physical failure. When we say a biological failure, we're talking about something like um, a project with a goal, let's say it's a wood introduction project with a goal of increasing summer rearing habitat for coho salmon. And you're pretty close to their um, tolerance thresholds for temperature now, and climate change says it's going to probably increase by four or five degrees. Then you're likely going to end up with a biological failure because the stream could be too hot for that habitat to function, even if it's physically available. So if your goal is for summer rearing habitat and that's not likely to occur, 
we'll go through one set of questions and and um, and answers for understanding how to adapt that kind of project to climate change. And that's a different thing than if we're talking about physical failure. So here we're talking about, uh, for example, if we're going to build wood structures and we expect the peak flows to increase by 30 or 40 percent over the next 20 or 30 years, we probably need to be designing that um, using design flows that are different than what we would normally use, meaning larger flows, uh, to help reduce the risk of physical failure. Uh, so again, just reduce the risk that the project will get blown out by a large flood. So I'll go through a couple of details on each of these. So reducing the risk of biological failure. So if, if the climate change is likely to lead to that, again, you know, here's the example shown in the subtext there. Um, what we want to consider in that case is um, a number of things that we reviewed in the 2013 paper. Uh, so the first one is, do the proposed restoration actions reduce climate change effects? So for example, if we have uh, a poor riparian condition with not a lot of shade, and we expect climate change to increase the temperature in that location, we can actually do something to help the temperature not go up as much by getting shade back in the riparian zone. So that's one way of reducing a climate change effect. And there are some others that we've reviewed in the paper, and I'll show you a bit of that. The second thing you could ask is, do the proposed restoration actions increase habitat diversity or ecosystem resilience? A good example of this for temperature is a floodplain system. If you look at a complex natural floodplain with multiple side channels, the thermal regimes are different in the main channel than they are in a groundwater channel, and that's different from what it would be in a hyperreactive channel. Uh, and so, if we have um, restoration actions that can increase the diversity of habitats and increase the diversity of the thermal regimes out there, then that's another way to reduce the likelihood of biological failure um, in the future. Um, so, as we say in the last bullet here, if the answers are yes, then you can proceed with the design. If not, then you need to think about whether that project goal is appropriate for that location and or whether you can change the design to help uh, either ameliorate the climate change effect or increase diversity in the zones. So here's a couple examples of things you might need as information. So this is from the 2013 paper. Um, and this is just showing temperature regimes uh, modeled using the VIC model in the Pacific Northwest. This is the entire Columbia Basin. So we're in British Columbia up here. And this is Washington coast, Oregon coast. This is the Cascade Range, Rocky Mountains over here. Um, and what you see is that uh, you know places like the Snake River Basin, which are here, uh, which is here, and then the central Columbia are fairly warm, even in the calibration period, which is 1970 to 99, uh, and then a little bit warm also in the Willamette and some of the lower Oregon, the southern Oregon coast. And then if we move to the 100-year-out scenario from that calibration period, uh, we see a pretty significant increase. These are four-degree bins, so if it's going from one color to another, the chances are that the temperature increase that we're talking about is at least two or three, maybe four degrees to go from one bin to another. So we see much more orange and red and yellow all throughout the interior of Columbia. So in general, we're looking at fairly large increases in temperature um, throughout the basin. So this is one piece of information that you could use um, along with other temperature data like the new Nor Norwest data set that Dan Isaac put together um, at the US Forest Service. That's available on the web. That also has climate change predictions in it. So those kinds of things can be used to help you understand what the climate change likelihood is for a place that you're looking at doing restoration in. And then we also have this table which looked at categories of restoration actions. And if you go to the original paper, each one of these is broken into a number of subcategories. And it's laid out kind of consumer report style so that you can see for each restoration action, what is the likelihood that it can reduce a stream temperature or increase a low flow or decrease a peak flow or increase resilience? Um, and here we're actually saying increase a low flow effect or decrease a peak flow effect. So for example, if we say de two things could happen to ameliorate this effect. One is it could actually decrease the peak flow um, by creating some storage. If you're getting floods out onto the floodplain, that attenuates a peak flow. Um, so something like floodplain connectivity could help with that. You could also not necessarily decrease the peak flow, but give the fish more options to get out of the way of the flow. So that would also ameliorate that peak flow effect biologically by giving the fish more ability to survive even if that change occurs. So that was the logic behind this table. 
and you notice that most of the green up here is for these connectivity types. We're talking about longitudinal, which is restoring upstream downstream stream connections, um, and that uh, uh, does things like you know allow fish to get to places with a different flow regime or lower temperature or something like that. Floodplain connectivity. I just gave an example of how that might you know uh, decrease a peak flow effect, um, and I talked earlier about how that can change thermal diversity, so that's increasing resilience as well as creating cooler temperatures. Um, and then restoring incised channel has similar effects to what floodplain connectivity is. In incised channels, as we as you saw in that bedrock channel early on, there was no gravel, and so with the water running across bedrock, it heats up really fast. And if you can restore some of that. The steep bedrock ones are difficult. There's a lot more of this in the interior of Columbia where there are low gradient channels and you can put in check dams or beaver dams or other kinds of structures to help store sediment which raises the bed and begins to refill that, that lost aquifer. Um, so that can have a lot of different effects and pretty much across the board um, is a good thing to do for climate change. Restoring in-stream flow and riparian rehabilitation have a little bit less ability or narrow, narrower ability to deal with climate change, but they are helpful. And then you notice that most of the in-stream stuff um, doesn't really have any ability to accomplish these things. Um, and so that doesn't mean you shouldn't do them because they may be necessary for something like salmon recovery um, today. Uh, but it may mean that you need to be considering some of these other things as well to make sure that if you're putting structures in the stream, for example, that it's not getting too hot or you know that the flows are manageable or that you're designing the structures so that they will withstand those flows. So you still have to consider climate change even if you're building those, but they by themselves will not ameliorate any of these three effects or increase resilience. So those are two pieces of information that you might use for understanding risk of biological failure and what you might be able to do about it. The second one is reducing risk of physical failure. So a climate change will lead to a physical failure, again, meaning something like the flood magnitude is going to increase and you know, just essentially wash out structures that you build because they're designed for today's flow and not the flow 30 or 40 years from now. There's a couple things you need to be aware of. One is make sure that the design flows that you use are future flows to the extent possible, and I'll go through a few ways that we can either make those predictions or use the best current information that we can. Um, and then the second thing to do is, uh, and so that leads you to do two things. One is to make sure that you design the project to handle that larger flow. The other thing it should lead you to do is make sure that there is room for the channel to get wider and deeper in the future, because an increasing peak flow is going to make a larger channel. Uh, and so we need to be a bit aware of that when we're designing um, essentially, especially channel dimensions. So a lot of times we're recreating channel meanders or something like that. And you want to size that for today's flow because oversizing it isn't going to work. It's just going to you know, essentially collapse in on itself and vegetation will encroach and it will adjust back to the size it needs to be. But you want to make sure that to the extent possible, if that channel is going to get bigger in the future, you design it for what it needs today but give it room to get wider or get deeper. Uh, so that um, it won't fail in the future. So what's going on that causes that? Well, the main thing is changing in the flow and change in the flow regime. So here's a map of the Pacific Northwest again, showing the snowmelt dominated zones, which are mostly in the North Cascades, and there's some in the Cascades as well, but they're too small to show up here, um, and a little bit in the Rockies. This middle zone, which is the transitional, or sometimes called the rain on snow zone, it's actually the transient snow zone where you have snow for part of the year or part of the winter, but it doesn't stick around very long. Um, and then this rain dominated zone, which is mostly on the coast and the lower elevation interior. So what we expect in the future is more like this. And this uh, is from one set of model runs uh, that shows pretty much all of the interior of Columbia turning into a rain dominated zone with transitional getting squished out perimeter and snow melt only left pretty much up in Canada. Um, and this is, uh, there, there are varying degrees um, depending on which models you choose and which climate scenarios you choose on how much of this will happen, but they all point to the same thing, that we're getting warmer and we're going to lose snowpack and so snow elevation will rise and more of the region will become rain dominated. And the question of, among different models is just how much of the region. This particular model shows quite a bit. The result of that is a change in peak flows, and so uh, where we have the largest changes in uh, snowpack, so essentially where we're losing all of the snowpack, like along the Cascade Crest or some of these interior Rocky Mountain or Blue Mountain systems, uh, 
we see the largest increases in flows. So those red ones are more than 50% increase. Uh, in this case, the, the highest monthly flow. The peak flows show a similar trend. Um, and then the yellow is a 10 to 50% increase. So a lot of the region is going to see some increase in peak flows. Um, and so we want to pay attention to what that prediction is telling us. And then there's a lot to consider about how much faith do we want to put in that prediction and do we want to be risk averse or um, risk tolerant. You know, all those things enter into the decision making once you have this information. So when you're designing a project, there's a standard design process that has a bunch of steps in a planning phase and then a design and implement phase. Um, and what climate change does really is influence the design criteria. There's some influences in other parts of the design too, but the main thing that we're talking about today is what it does to design criteria. And I'll just do the example of increasing peak flow. And so if we're doing either preliminary design or final design, we want to make sure that the flow we're using in the design um, is appropriate for the lifespan of the project. So if we expect the lifespan of the project to be 30 years, we want to make sure we're at least looking at what's predicted to occur 30 years out. And if it's 50 years or 100 years, we need to look farther out at the predictions and make sure that the design flows are appropriate for that lifespan. So there's three ways. Uh, here's the first example, three ways to revise design flow estimates for project design. One is to use only the recent portion of the record. The second is to extra extrapolate a past trend, which statisticians aren't very happy with, but sometimes that's um, the one thing that you can do, uh, and then use climate change projections. Um, so any of those can be used, and you can use multiples if you uh, prefer to triangulate the problem and see if they're all telling you essentially the same thing. Uh, so here's an example of just using the most recent part of the record. So here's the pre-1970 part of the record in black and in blue is the post-1970. And this is from New England. And you can see that um, the trend is pretty significant. This peak flow has gone up, uh, let's say, from probably 30 cubic meters per second to 50 cubic meters per second. So a little over 50% between these two periods. So that's, for the two-year flood, a pretty significant jump. And so it's worth paying attention to that. If you use the whole record, which is kind of standard hydrological practice, you end up somewhere in the middle, which means even if you're using, um, uh, even though this isn't using a future flow for the design, it's using something that's more appropriate than if you use the whole record, because even with the whole record, you will underestimate what we're having now, let alone what we're going to have in the future. So that's one thing you can do to make sure you're not drastically underestimating the size of the flows. The second one is extrapolating a past trend. So here we have um, a, a period of record. This one's 1940 to 2009. And if there's a trend in that period of record, we can use that trend to say, OK, you know, it's increasing at x number of CMS per year. Uh, and if we're looking uh, to 2050 uh, from this 2009 period, a 40-year period, we would predict some change in the two-year flow. Uh, and we can also predict a change in the 100-year flow or whatever flows we need. So for de designing structures, we're probably looking at more like the 100-year flow. For designing channels, we're probably looking at more like the two-year flow. So there's lots of options here on what to do. And there's a lot of um, uncertainty on how to make some of these choices. But this is also one option, looking at the past trend. In this case, you want to make sure one note on this is you want to make sure that your trend data set is very long because there are lots of ups and downs in the hydrologic record. And if you pick a short one, you can either get a decreasing trend that doesn't reflect the overall or an increasing trend that doesn't reflect the overall trend over a long time period. So you want to make sure that that period of record is, is quite long uh, to do that one. And then you can also, again, just use um, model changes uh, for lots of different places. So instead of calculating it from a trend, you model it based on the climate change models. And this is an example um, from a study that looked at a bunch of different places in the United States. And you can see that in New England and in the western US, we're generally looking at increasing peak flows compared to the central uh, US and, and sort of east coast and south where we're looking. Uh, it looks like more at negative trends in the peak flow. So those are three ways that you can go about um, estimating change in peak flow for the design. Uh, so that's pretty much all I was going to go through. Uh, th there was more I could put in, but I didn't want it to run too long. And so just a few key points. Um, data on natural wood sizes and functions can be used to guide restoration design. So again, just going back to looking at what we understand about how wood functions naturally, we can use that to help us figure out things like what kind of structure or what size of wood we need to use in a design. 
And then where climate change will reduce biological effectiveness, we need to think about project goals and types of project. It's not so much about designing for a different flow, it's more about is this the right thing for this place given the biological response and what the climate change prediction is likely to be. And then finally, where climate change will increase peak flows, we can adjust design flows for project design. So that's all I had for today. I have citations here in the back, uh, so I'll put this up for a second. This is one page, and then there's another page of citations. And if people want these, we can send out, um, probably send a PDF of this presentation. So that's all I have. Okay, so we have we have two options for folks to ask questions. You can either post a question in the question pod, or you can raise your hand, and I can activate your microphone. And you can ask directly. I'll give you a chance to compose yourself and while we're while we're waiting, those of you that have multiple people at your site that are watching today's program, if you do just send me an email with the names of those individuals um, that were at your site, I can get their um, progress recorded uh, in their transcript for the, at least for the DNR. So we have a number of biologists on the line here. Um, don't don't be afraid to ask a question here. Kind of bear with us there, Tim. Yep. I did post the um, the link for those of you that want uh, Society of American Foresters credits. Uh, you can. Click on that link, and if for some reason you can't pull that off, just send me an email with your contact information. <laughs> 